All right, so this lecture is on covalent bonding and Lewis structures, and this is <clears throat> chapter 10 in the fifth edition of Tro, chapter 9 in the older versions. <clears throat> so to understand covalent bonding, this is a diagram that's very well known. This is called the potential energy diagram. And um, so the examples for hydrogen where you have two atoms of hydrogen and you watch them kind of come together to make the molecule and then they, if it's too, if they get too close to each other, there's this repulsion of the nuclei. <clears throat> so this is uh, potential energy versus, this is called the reaction coordinate here where you're looking at the molecules and how they're changing in time. And uh, notice that this is zero potential energy here in kilojoules. So you start way out here at zero potential energy, and then you have the two hydrogen atoms and you're starting to bring them closer together. Uh, R is the distance and, let me see if I can pull that up, hold on. Okay, oh, there it is, yeah, it says uh, it's in picometers here, so this is 10 to the minus 12 meters. So 300 picometers is the distance at this point. Just starting a little bit of interaction here. As they get closer and closer together, at this point, it's about 150 picometers. <clears throat> uh, you can see there's some interaction between the two hydrogens. The covalent bond is really just the force between the two atoms. It's just a force. And so you can see that as they get, as the hydrogen, two hydrogens get uh, closer and closer together, that energy is being given off to, in this process. And I guess this particular slide doesn't say it, <clears throat> but this is the attractive part of the potential energy, PE, potential energy, <coughs> and energy is given off during that process. When energy is given off, that means it's stabilizing. So it's becoming more stable as we're getting closer together. All right, so then finally it's gonna come down and reach this minimum here at about 74 uh, picometers. And, uh, so the hydrogen actually kind of extend, the two hydrogens extend out to a certain distance and then they come back together. Uh, what's going on in this part here is that you, it's attractive. So the electron on one of the hydrogens is attracted to the nucleus on the other hydrogen and vice versa. So they're attracted to each other, they're getting closer and closer together. At this point, they're not gonna get any closer together without creating some instability. So this minimum here indicates the most stable position. Now the hydrogen is going, the H2 is um, going back and forth. It's actually the stretching or the vibration <clears throat> of the bond. So it extends out and the distance is a little bit higher and then it comes back in and it's lower and then they, I'd have to use two fingers to do this, but if I'm just gonna one side here. It, during the stretch it comes out and then they're attracted to each other, it comes back and it goes out and back and out and back and it's doing on both sides at the same time. And so that's the nature of the vibration. The minimum is the distance associated with the equilibrium position. And then also the energy difference right here, this 432, is the energy needed to break, uh, break the bond. So you have to add energy to release the two hydrogens from each other. Now, if it gets closer together, there's a repulsive interaction. And this part is the repulsive part of the potential energy curve. And uh, energy is absorbed in that process, so. Uh, yeah, so it's just kind of the balance between the two uh, repulsive and attractive interactions that make up that covalent bond. All right. Uh, next, we talk about Pauling's electronegativity scale. This is Linus Pauling. He was a very famous um, Nobel laureate 
chemistry professor from Caltech, and he did lots of different things, including uh, developing this scale for the elements in the table uh, in terms of their electronegativity. <clears throat> so electronegativity is a tendency of an atom in a bond to attract electrons in the bond towards itself. So for example, <clears throat> if you have HCl, that's the covalent bond, right? <clears throat> And you look at the numbers in the table. So you have 3.0 for chlorine and, let's see, the hydrogen there. And then 2.1 for hydrogen. And you can see that chlorine has a greater electronegativity than hydrogen. So it has a greater, greater tendency to draw the electrons in the bond towards itself. So use these numbers, <coughs> excuse me, to, um, to determine that. And, okay, so for oxygen, it's 3.5. For hydrogen, it's 2.1. For carbon, it's uh, 2.5. Chlorine, 3.0. Phosphorus, 2.1. And uh, sodium, 0.9. And I think that's all. Okay. All right. Now, the book has a, kind of a more modern way of discussing what types of covalent bonds they are. Um, uh, I tend to go with the older criteria in some of the older books, so let me go over both of them with you so you don't get confused. I believe in your lab manuals now. This kind of book version is what's used. So if you take the difference in the electronegativities between the two atoms that make up that covalent bond, um, if there's no difference between them, we say it's zero, and we say, or the book says, that the bond is pure covalent. If the difference in electronegativity goes from uh, 0.1 to 0.4, then it's called nonpolar covalent. If it's between 0.5 and 1.9, then it's polar covalent. And if it's greater than 2, then it's ionic. That's an awful lot for me to remember. This is the way I learned it down below. If the difference between them is 0, it's nonpolar. Uh, if it's between 0 and 1.9, it's polar. And then if it's two or greater, it's ionic. So I do tend to use this older criteria. You can uh, do what you want. <clears throat> it's good to know both. Now I wrote them down. I wrote those down. All right, so the question here, are the bonds polar? And let me just for one minute jot this down. I'm going to go back and pull the electronegativities out of the table. Let me go back down. And now, how do you decide if the bond is polar or not? You take the difference between the numbers. So, in the case of OH, oops, it's 3.5 minus the hydrogen 2.1. So that's going to be 1.4. Is it greater than zero? Yes. And so the bond is polar. Okay, carbon and chlorine, 2.5. And you take the absolute value. You don't want to have negative values here. Just We're looking at the magnitude of the number here. And chlorine is 3.0, so the difference here is 0 0.5, it's polar. Phosphorus 2.1 minus hydrogen 2.1 is 0, so in this case it's nonpolar. This is something that if you just looked at phosphorus and hydrogen, you'd probably guess that it was polar, but if you actually look at the numbers, you see that they coincidentally, they just have the same numerical value. All right, for sodium, it's 0.9, and then chlorine 3.0, so the difference is 2.1, and this is greater than 2, so this is going to be ionic. Okay, so that's how you decide. And here's a picture where you're comparing chlorine with three different, uh, three different things here. And so the left-hand side, you have the chlorine-chlorine, and you have uh, 
minus 3.0 is 0, so you'd say it's pure covalent, or you can just say that it's nonpolar. All right, here's the case in the middle where you have hydrogen and chlorine, and you can see the difference, but also the chlorine is so much bigger here. So the chlorine has a greater tendency to draw the electrons to itself. It's bigger anyway. And so this whole thing here is this big old cloud that kind of combines the idea that the actual electrons in the bond are in here, but also you got extra electrons because of the size. So it's a pretty dramatic difference there. And then here's um, sodium chloride. You take the difference 2.1, so it's ionic. And this is where the electron has jumped completely from the sodium to the chlor chlorine and to make chloride. And I like this, um, this slide because you can um, see that it's kind of of a continuum. You start with pure covalent or nonpolar, and then um, you, know, you end up with something ionic. And this polar covalent is kind of the in-between situation. <clears throat> All right, here's some notes that I made up, and let's go through those. So we're using the term bond dipole, and the bond dipole is just saying that there's a separation between partial positive and partial negative. So it's not all the way negative. If it was, then it would be ionic, right? But kind of that partial pull, and you get this separation of the charge, and so that's referred to as a dipole. <clears throat> The dipole moment is defined as the vector sum of the dipoles. I don't know if you remember vectors from your math classes, but um, you can certainly look that up. <coughs> and okay, so in the cases, in the case of a diatomic molecule, the bond dipole is the dipole moment. Let me just get through it and I'll show you what I mean. In the case of the molecule with more than two atoms, the dipole moment for the molecule is the vector sum of the, of the bond dipoles. If it's greater than zero, the molecule is polar. So here's HCl again. This is a little bit different depiction here. You know, that's the chlor chlorine and the hydrogen. And then um, another symbolism that we use, we draw the, yeah, I don't see it there, but the HCl bond, you draw the bond, and then you use this arrow. This is very commonly used. So the tip of the arrow is pointing towards the more electronegative element, and then this would be the, the more positive or the electropositive end of the arrow. So the hydrogen, therefore, is less an electronegative than the chlorine. You saw this on the last slide. <clears throat> this delta here means partial. So this is saying there's a partial positive charge on the hydrogen and a partial negative charge on the chlorine. So we use those interchangeably. Okay, the idea that you can uh, talk about the dipole moment for the molecule overall is seen here. And with this example of CO2, you can, uh, let's see, I get the numbers here, I guess. So you've got the oxygen is, this is 3.5, and the carbon is 2.5. So the difference between them tells you that the bond is polar. This is saying <clears throat> that that bond is polar, and the electronegative end is on the oxygen. But you have the exact same opposite. Same uh, dipole moment, same dipole, I guess I should say but pointing in the opposite direction. So overall, the sum of the, di of the bond dipoles equals zero. Think of it as a tug of war. You got one CO bond pulling to the right, the other CO bond pulling to the left, or you could say the oxygen on the right is pulling equally against the oxygen on the left. So we would say here that the molecule has zero dipole moment, therefore it is nonpolar, nonpolar molecule. All right, here's the example with the vectors. This is water. So your oxygen, again, is 3.5. The hydrogen is 2.1. The difference between them uh, makes it polar and it, the arrow is going to point along the bond towards the electronegative oxygen and you see it on two sides. So I'm not going to ask you about this but I'll tell you anyway. 
that, um, let's see, if this were an XY axis or axes, um, you can look at the fact that the hydrogen to oxygen is increasing. We can call that the y-axis. It's increasing along the y-axis. And what you do is you look at the projection. It's a sine cosine thing. You look at the, pro the projection onto the y-axis. <clears throat> so this part right here is the amount of this bond that is that contributes to the y-axis. So the measurement is what I'm putting in dots here. Then the same thing here, you project the y component of the HO bond onto the y-axis. Then <clears throat> separately, you take this and you add it to that. So in other words, you've got this for the first one and then you add I'll put a line there and then you add the second one to get the total and <clears throat> you can see along the y-axis that there is a dipole and um, it is the sum of those two y-axis projections so this is saying that overall there is a dipole moment and let me do one more thing here. Erase all that. And in the end, once you kind of get used to it, you can say that the overall moment is pointing in that direction, and that's approximately the magnitude. I think I drew it a little bit bigger than I should have, but you say, okay, is the molecule po is the molecule polar? The answer is yes. So those two OH dipoles do not cancel each other. They add together along that y-axis. So the dipole moment points upward, and therefore it's a polar molecule. All right, that's the way you want to think about it. We're going to look at uh, some pretty elaborate uh, molecules as we get more into our Lewis dots and then our Vesper structure. So we'll be using this for quite a, quite a while. <clears throat> Water that we just talked about is indeed a polar molecule. And in this um, experiment, you can take a glass rod and just kind of rub a cloth over it. It has the effect of transferring some of the electrons from the cloth onto the outer surface of the glass rod. So this has got a, a negative charge. Not real strong, but it's got some charge associated with it. <clears throat> and it, it, it uh, pulls the water molecules towards it. It's very interesting. Now hexane, on the other hand, is a hydrocarbon. Hexane is C6H14. Uh, and if you write out the structure, you would see that this is a nonpolar, not gonna do it, we'll do it later, but it's a nonpolar molecule. And uh, same charged glass rod here, but there's no effect on the nonpolar hexane as it's streaming through. <laughs> All right, we're ready to start our dots. And um, this is just part of our job. As soon as we finish this, we'll start to talk about Vesper structures and uh, kind of the difference between them is that the Lewis dots give you information about uh, the number of bonds, the t of covalent bonds, the type of them, meaning single, double, or triple, how many lone pair electrons there are. You get all that information from Lewis dot, but you don't get the geometry of the molecule. That's where the Vesper uh, model comes in. <clears throat> So we start here, you know, you can write your, put your bonds at right angles to each other, the, the Lewis structure, but uh, that has nothing to do with reality. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat. <clears throat> so scratchy today. Okay, so here are the rules. We're going to start with the correct formula. We're not going to change it as we go along. We're going to count the number of valence electrons. If ionic, we're going to add an electron if it's an anion into the count, and uh, if it's a cation, we're gonna subtract an electron. 
uh, one pair of electrons per bond, complete octets of atoms bonded to central atoms. If the central atom has less than an octet, we're going to form multiple bonds. All right, so I think I set this up so I could do, do this right on this, <clears throat> on this page. So what we want to do here with methane, we want to, you could do the count. That, 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 I'm going to show you two methods here. All right, we'll start with um, carbon in the periodic table. So it is in period, group 4A or group 14. And that is telling us that, that four in there is telling us that um, carbon has four electrons in the valence shell. You could also look at carbon and you could say that it has a total of six electrons, right? So one S, whoops, one S2, two S2, two P2 for carbon. This is N, e, N equals two is the valence shell. So from this, right? You can see that uh, there's four that it has four electrons, four electrons in the valence shell. All right, so that means you can start with carbon, put in your four electrons in the valence shell, and then with hydrogen, it's just one s one. So the hydrogen then is going to have four of them. You can tell by the formula. And then each one contributes an electron. I'll put it there. Okay, and so you end up with um, the octet. So if you count around, you say two, four, six, eight, you get the octet rule being obeyed um, because of the sharing of the electrons. So that's, that's why we say covalent bonds are associated with sharing. So you can finish it up then and, and draw this. Okay, so that's method one. And then um, the other way to do it, I told you I was going to do all this on one page, I'm not. <laughs> uh, but uh, the other way to do it would be to say that um, you look at the formula CH4. Okay, the carbon, there's one carbon and it has four valence electrons. There's four hydrogens, each with one valence electron. So there's a total of eight electrons. And then you just position your atoms and then just put the bonds in, two, four, six, eight, like that. So I know you like the second method better, but the reason why I go through the details of the dots with different colors and so on is that you can have a sense of where the electrons came from and then what happened to them <laughs> during the formation of the, the bond. All right, looks like I'm gonna need more paper. Let me write this down. So we have NH3, H2O, C2, H6, four, and C2H4. All right, more more space. So the next one is NH3. And if you look in the periodic table, you're going to see that nitrogen is in group 5A or group 15. That 5 there, that's the number of valence electrons. You can uh, study the periodic table to see that that's true. So um, <clears throat> you can draw it. You can put 1, 2, 3, 4. And then you got one more, you can put it anywhere you want. I like to put them on the top, but you can put them anywhere you want. Then your hydrogens each contribute one. And so then uh, your final picture, two uh, electrons make a single covalent bond. Your final picture includes these two lone pair electrons. Okay. And it's very important that you carry those around because those electrons are crucial to uh, acid-base chemistry because this, um, this molecule ammonia is a base. The other way to do this would just be to say one atom of nitrogen with five electrons plus three hydrogens, each with one is eight, and you could do this. Two, four, six, eight. Whatever works for you. Okay. 
uh, next is that I call, yeah, called water is the exception. But in general, you have um, the central atom listed on the left with water being the exception. So uh, water and oxygen is in group 6A or group 16, so six valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. And you could make bonds to hydrogen. So you're going to get, you notice the right angle geometry here. That's absolutely wrong. That is not the geometry. It's just telling us that there are two single bonds and two sets of lone pair electrons. Uh, I, so I just said, hold on, lone pair electrons, they're also called... non-bonding electrons. Okay, and then the other way to do it would be to say one atom of oxygen with six electrons plus two atoms of hydrogen each with one, so that's eight, and then you'd come up with the same drawing. <clears throat> All right, then the next one is C2H6. Um, well, hydrogen's the exception for that. And um, one of the rules, by the way, is that if you go back, okay, so in this case, we've got two central atoms. you got two carbons. You want to place the hydrogens around. And then you can say that each carbon has four, each hydrogen has one, and so this translates into a single bond, single bonds all the way around. So this would be the correct answer. All right, you have C2H4. Doesn't matter where you put them. But in general with these, uh, at least for the elements in period two, you put everything at right angles. So now you have one, two, three, four, one, uh, two, three, four. Okay, now let's put the hydrogens in. Okay, do you have the octet rule? So this carbon has a total of two, four, six, seven. And similarly, the, through sharing, this one has seven as well. So you can't have that, carbon always has to have the octet rule obeyed. And so the trick here is to take that electron and move it in between, take this one and move it in between. So then you have <clears throat> four in between and that's a double bond. So if you have four electrons, that's a double bond. That's the answer right there. And this is ethylene, ETH, whoops. No good. E-T-H-Y-L-E-N-E. -E. That is the common name for it. And that's the one everyone uses. But the systematic name is ethene. It's probably better to know than to know that. It's good to know them both, but the ethylene is the one that everybody uses. All right, then the last example here was C. Yeah, that was C2. Wait a minute. H4. This one is C2H2. And this is acetylene. So do the same thing. You're putting the hydrogens as far apart as possible. That's kind of a, 
a trend that we observe here. And so you have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then the hydrogens one and one. Ask the same question through shearing. How many electrons are there? Two, four, six. How many electrons are there here? Two, four, six. Can't have that. So to solve the problem, move these two in. Like that. Then you have hydrogen. One, two, three, four, five, six. Like that. And that corresponds to a triple bond. But actually, before I write it down, now you have 6 plus 2 is 8, and 6 plus 2 is 8. So that's how you take care of the octet rule. And then the final answer is this. So this is called acetylene. That's the name you want to know, acetylene. And the that's the common name, but the systematic name would be S-E-T-H, corresponds to two carbons. So you have ethane, ethene, and in this case, it's going to be a Y-N-E. That's the systematic uh, name. Y-N-E means triple bond. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, now we're going to just go through just some rules, I guess, uh, exceptions to the octet rule. Uh, the, if you look in the periodic table, you have in period two, you have um, beryllium, and then boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. And um, so in this part of the table right here, you are always going to see the octet rule being obeyed. So there's eight around the central atoms. Hydrogen, obviously, has a maximum of two. One from each, but it can have a maximum of two. Now, beryllium and boron don't do that. So these are the exceptions. And uh, in this case, it's they can have less than eight. <clears throat> now, for elements in all the other periods, this would be period three, and then there's period four, and so on. The elements on this side, <clears throat> that are uh, like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, they can have greater than eight. But for period two, it's only eight. You're not gonna see greater than eight for this set right in here. But right below it, it might be eight, or it might be 10, or it might even be 12. So I'll show you examples of that. But right now we're focusing on beryllium and boron. <clears throat> Both of them are in period two. And beryllium can have, has two electrons, and boron has three by itself. And so let's pick the ones with hydrogen to keep it simple. So for beryllium, uh, this is in group two. So that means it's got two valence electrons. Then here are the hydrogens. So this is saying that beryllium hydride has only four, right? It doesn't have eight, it's got four. Hydrogen can have a maximum of two, and in beryllium, it can only have a maximum of four. <clears throat> That's it, you don't have any lone pairs left over. For uh, boron, boron has three electrons in the valence shell, and um, Bonding with hydrogen again, keep it simple. Like that. And so boron can own the maximum number of electrons through bonding that boron can have is six. So four electrons around the central atom, six electrons around the central atom. And in this case, you can get that. 
Okay, you just gotta remember that. Don't start messing around. Don't try and make double bonds. <laughs> the way we just did when when we didn't have an octet before with the carbon compounds. What did we do? We grabbed electrons and brought them into the central atom to make eight, but in this case you don't because it's an exception. All right, so this is on the other side um, where you can see elements in period three or higher. They can have either eight or greater than eight, and it goes up to a maximum of 12. So it's got eight, 10, or 12. And SF6 and PCL4 are two examples of that. So sulfur is right under oxygen in the periodic table, group 16. There's six electrons, one, two, three, four, five, put it down here, six. Um, and in this case, you're not going to, this is a little bit of a different, you know, when you go around, you start doubling up. But the way this thing is bonded, they're not doubled up. Four, five, six, that would be correct. And then each fluorine has seven, one for bonding, and then three pairs of non-bonding electrons. So one for bonding, three pairs, so that's a total of seven, and um, all the way around. So then you redraw it. Okay, and do you have to put the lone pair electrons in? Yes, you do. It's easier with an Apple Pencil than it is with a pen. So that would be the answer. <clears throat> How many electrons are on the central atom? Two, four, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve for this example. All right, phosphorus is right under nitrogen in the periodic table. Let's see if we got some space here. The PCL four, and this shows you what to do with if it's got a negative charge as well. So then. Um, the rule here, you can say phosphorus has got five electrons around the valence shell. One, two, three, four, five, six. And the rule is that the extra electron from the negative charge goes around the central atom. So you add that in. Now you got six electrons and you can form bonds with four chlorines. <clears throat> So one, two, three, four, like that. Wait a minute, did I count right? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, I, I miscounted here. Phosphorus has five, and then you add one more uh, for the chlorine, chloro the, the negative electron on the chloride. I said that incorrectly. The negative electron here, it's just an electron, is just added into the count around the center. Okay, that's better. All right, now you can put your chlorines in. Each one has seven, one of which makes a covalent bond, so there's six non-bonding electrons. And you got this lone pair. Now, I do it this way. I put all of my bonds together because that helps me count how many electrons I have for lone pairs. Okay, and then this, um, scrunch it down a little bit here. Then the answer would be P with one, two, three, four bonds to chlorine. And then there's this lone pair here. And then do you have to put your lone pairs in? Yes, you do. Okay, the other thing is that you put in brackets with a negative on the outside. You wanna remember that it's a charged um, ion 
and um, then you have counted that extra electron. All right, so we see lots of examples where it's greater than eight. In this case, you have two, four, six, eight, ten uh, electrons around the central atom. And that was PCL4 minus. There's another one. Actually, I got a blank page, I'll put it right here. So PCL4 minus. All right, so it's similar, but it's charged. So you can start out with phosphorus with five. Phosphorus is right under nitrogen in the periodic table, so it has five. You're gonna add one more because of the charge. One more electron you add in. And then, as I said, I, um, wait a minute, stop. All right, the next topic is resonance. And here, I'm going to show you by example what we're doing. We'll start with the SO3 on this page. So for SO3, if you want to work out the numbers here, sulfur has six. Sulfur is right under oxygen in the periodic table, so it's got six, just like oxygen does. Then you have three oxygens, each having six. So that's four times six, so that's 24 electrons total. All right, now. You put your sulfur in the middle, because that's the one listed on the left, like this. And then you can say 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. Okay, so that is what you would get. And the problem here is that there, there is not an octet for the central atom. Now, sulfur's in period three. It can either have um, eight, 10, or 12, but it's certainly not gonna have two, four, six, right? It's not gonna have two, four, six. So this is not correct. You wanna make sulfur have at least eight. That's the easiest thing to do. So we can, Bring in a lone pair here or here or here. There's three ways to do it, okay? And so those are called resonance structures. One of them has the double bond on the right, double headed arrow onto the, whoops, sulfur. Um, double-headed arrow on the bottom, double-headed arrow. The next resonance structure has the double head, the double bond. I didn't mean to say double-headed arrow. I meant to say double bond on the left, like that. And of course, you got to put in your lone pairs. So let's see, two, four, six, eight. That's going to leave us. Um, 16 lone pair electrons. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. Now notice here that the oxygen has two, lone, two for the lone pair, four for the double bond, and two more here. So it's got an octet. The sulfur has an octet. The oxygens have octets as well. So this is the motivation for this. And go back and put in some more lone pairs. Like that. All right, I think that looks good. So these are the three resonance structures. And um, you can think of it as this uh, pair of electrons here is kind of shared between the three positions. So you could think like in one instant it's here, the next instant it shows up here, and in the next instant it's over here, and it's kind of going back and forth between the three possible positions. So you have that extra pair of electrons. Um, but that is one picture of it that's called the valence bond picture so which is that the electron pair 
moves in time between the three positions. The other picture is that that electron pair is kind of smushed out over all three positions. Because remember, these are orbitals. These are electron waves or electron clouds, right? So the other picture is called the molecular orbital picture. You have sulfur with three bonds to oxygen. And then this third pair of electrons is delocalized over the entire structure. So those dots that I just drew make up one pair of electrons. Like that. So that is referred to as the molecular orbital orbital picture and uh, it's there are just two different theories that have been developed over the years in the end you might say that it's somewhere in between these two ideas you don't have to put that in brackets I'm putting it in brackets above because it's got the three structures going back and forth um, so, uh, you know, two different theories that have a mathematical basis. They were developed at different points in time. Actually, Linus Pauling of Pauling Electronegativity, he's the one that came up with this one, the valence bond picture. Turns out the valence bond is a little bit more um, tedious to work with when you have big molecules because there's so many different structures you can draw. Uh, this one is just very easy for calculations. So you use equations and computers and whatnot to calculate the energies of the bonds. Um, but organic chemists do tend to use the valence bond, this one, the valence bond picture, uh, quite a bit. So you'll see it next year. All right, and then, all right, so that's the SO3. Uh, the next example is NO2 minus, and the last one, nitrite, and the last one is acetate. So let's look at, make a new page here. There's SO3. Okay. So you're looking at the fact that there's one, two, three structures, and the fact that there are four, uh, blow this up a little bit. Dumb idea. Very dumb idea. <laughs> um, let me do this in blue or something. Yeah. So there's the green and the black. So there's four groups of electrons. And then there are three positions. Let me just do this here. This is one of them. So there are one, two, three, four pairs of electrons. And then those pairs that, that count, those four pairs of electrons, um, are positioned over three uh, bonds, three positions. So three, one, two, three places, three positions. The other way to say it would be that there are one, two, three, four groups of electrons, and you need three structures to describe it. So I'll go back now. So this is going to be NO2 minus, and I'm going to look to see if there's any res resonance structures needed. So start, you put the atoms as far apart as possible. It's a good rule to start with. Nitrogen has one, two, three, four, five, and then you're gonna add in one more because it's got a negative charge. Then uh, the oxygens are one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, you play around a little bit and that's what you might end up with. So um, the problem here is that the nitrogen only has six around the central atom. 
And so it wants eight. It can do so by grabbing this electron pair and bringing it in to make eight, or it could do it this way. Okay, so there's two different ways it can be done. And so one of them has got double bond, two lone pair electrons, single bond. Okay, and then similarly for the other side. And I forgot the lone pair, so you got one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so this ends up being Okay, now you have uh, two, four, six, eight for each nitrogen, each oxygen's two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight. So that's done. Put brackets around it, and because it's charged, you want to put a negative sign on it like that. Now, later on, we'll come back to this for the best for structure. And we'll say things about polarity and how it bonds and so on. So we'll come back. But in this case, you have two resonance structures. The definition. And you've got three groups of electrons, right? You got one, two, three groups of electron pairs and they are in two positions, right? So there's gonna be three over two. The molecular orbital picture. You have nitrogen. Don't worry about the lone pair electrons. The third uh, pair of electrons is kind of split equally. So you got half here and half here. That's the um, molecular orbital picture. So you'd say that there's one pair and then a half a pair here, so one and a half, and then there's one pair plus half a pair, so there's one and a half there. So the NO bond order, right? The bond order for the NO bond order is this. The NO bond order is this. They're going to be the same on average, right? So you have uh, C2H3O2 minus. That's acetate. And since I know something about the structure here, I'll go ahead and put my atoms in this order. So we have two, four, six. Wait a minute. So we're going to go two times four plus three times one plus two times six. And you're going to add one more into the count for the negative charge. So that's eight. Get that right? Eight and four is twelve and twelve is twenty-four electrons. So you got two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. You got twelve more to go. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Okay, are we done? Is the molecule this is two dots right here. Is the molecule happy? And the answer is no because it's only got oops. It's only got six electrons around that central atom right there. So it can grab a pair of electrons from this oxygen, move it in to make a double bond, or from this oxygen, move it in and make a double bond. So you have, this is called the methyl group, CH3. bonded to the carbon, which will have double bond to one of the oxygens, single to the other. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. And you've got octets everywhere. You want to put that in brackets. 
double headed arrow for the other resonance structure. The methyl is not involved in resonance. The only part that's involved in resonance is the carbon oxygen, the oxygen carbon oxygen system. negative on the outside. Okay, so there's two resonance structures for acetate. All right, now we're ready to talk about bond order. Get SO3. There are two resonance structures. Think of the, it's gonna be water. So we are looking at the C O bond order. This pair here can be up top or it can be at the side. That's the one that's shared equally between the two. So we could say here that this is um, three groups of electrons and two positions. So that's going to be one and a half as well. A nitrite. Oops. All right. We're interested. Oh, I forgot you the acetate. Let me. And this is defined two different ways in my mind. So it'll be the number of electron pairs in resonance divided by the number of bonds in resonance. Or you could say the number of electron pairs in resonance divided by the number of resonance structures. So let's go back and first. So there's four pairs of electrons that are in resonance, and then they're they're placed into three bonds. So in the case of uh, the SO bond order, there's four electron pairs divided by three positions, so it's 1.33 or one and one third. Okay. And the second definition, the number of electron pairs divided by the number of resonance structures. You can do it either way. Okay. So for the NO2 minus, as the answer here, so this would be 3 over 2 or 1.5 would be the bond order. So if you have, so there's one, and then there's that other half, that other electron pair is split in half. The acetate, you're just looking at the CO bond order. And we can fill it in here. We could say three groups of electrons over two positions, 1.5. Now, bond order uh, in general, if there is a single bond, the bond order equals one. If it's a double bond, bond order is two. And if it's a triple bond, bond order is three. So if it's one and a half, it's in between, right? It's in between a single and a double. And one and a third, it's in between. It's not quite a single bond. It's a little bit more than a single bond, but it's not quite a double bond. So that's what you uh, do with those numbers. That's how you think about them. All right, then let's see a couple more slides here. This is coordinate covalent bond, kind of a simple idea that you have a pair of electrons from one atom that's shared between the two. So if you have ammonia NH3, and now you bring in the H+, plus, which doesn't have any electrons, it'll make a bond. It's an H+, plus, right? Remember, the hydrogen is one proton plus one electron. So the proton, the H plus, where the electron's been removed, H plus is one proton. And so that's what we're talking about here. It's a proton that comes in. This is very common in acid-base chemistry. And then it makes a molecule. And, but this is unusual because it's called a coordinate covalent bond. It's unusual because both electrons come from the nitrogen. So we draw an arrow then instead of a line. Okay. 
you don't put that here you put it on the outside like that uh, another example is NH3 again I'll put the electron pairs over there instead BF3 is one of those that does not have an octet remember put fluorines there instead of hydrogens They're going to react to form a coordinate covalent bond where the two electrons come from the nitrogen <laughs> and uh, point towards or shared with the boron and uh, pointing in that direction. All right, you probably won't see that again, but 